Does this mic work? Oh, wow, it does. Okay, so um, just in the interest of time, I know we have an hour and a half, and so I thought we'd just go ahead and start on time. Plus, we have a little warning here, Sean. Uh, we have three folks that are all either currently or formerly academics um, or teach, uh, including myself. So th there's a lot of risk on this one for us going long if left to our own devices. So I just really want to make sure we, we, we make this one practical for you. So um, let me start out by just introducing myself. My name is Joseph Fershine. I lead the Board of Governors Community Development Function. So as, as um, you know, each of the 12 reserve banks has a community development function, and then we have one at the board as well. Um, and I have the honor of leading the boards. So um, it's, it's just great for me to be at this conference. This is one of the best. I don't know if you've been at this conference in the past, but I've always found this to be one of the best community development conferences, partly because of the interaction, as, as Teresa was saying this morning when, when she gave her opening remarks, of the interaction between academics, practitioners and, you know, and policy people. Um, so I'm hoping we can have that, even though everybody on this panel has some academic event, almost all of them, all of them have basically also been policymakers and practitioners, so we have a kind of a good combination. Um, in terms of how we're going to do this, uh, we're going to have, um, we have three folks, which I'll, I'm not going to go into their bios in detail, but I will tell you a little bit about them. But as you know from your packet, there's detailed bios, so you can, you can read up on them. Um, but but in a, just in a second here, I'm going to turn it over. First, we're going to have um, John Landis. Um, he's going to go. Um, then we're going to have um, Dick Voth go. And then finally, Rafa, oh, sorry, uh, Raphael Vostick is going to go second, and then Dick is going to take us home with, with his. We'll, we'll take approximately 15 minutes um, Per, per person, but that's that's kind of a rough estimate. Someone might go a little less, and someone go, might go a little more. We've got Marty in the front here. He's got the sign. He can keep us honest. Um, so I'm just going to say a few things um, about this topic. One is, you know, the topic of the, the the written topic of the presentation of the of the session is, oh, how the housing market has changed. Um, and so, if I were you, and I'm sitting in this audience, I think you know one of the things I'd want to know is, okay, how has the housing market changed? Um, secondly, I think one of the recurring themes of this conference, it seems like it always is, is if the title of this conference is Reinventing Older Communities, we had this com conversation in our panel called What's an Older Community? And so uh, hopefully as we're answering the question, how has the housing market changed, we can ask the question, how has it changed with older communities? And then within the, the question of older communities, what are some interesting segments we can look at? So. It's always interesting to know who's done better, who's done worse, and, and, and is there any rhyme or reason to that? Um, what about on the West Coast, where I'm from? You know, how does do they have older communities on the West Coast? Is Seattle one? I mean, so what does it look like? I think we can we can talk a little bit about that. Um, the, um, the, the this other issue that, that I think would be interesting is larger versus smaller, because even even with an old, there's you know people always bring up Detroit, and what I like, always like to say is there's only one Detroit and there's only one New York, and so you can't necessarily generalize in this business. Um, so um, the other thing I really want to hopefully get out of this panel, just like the last session, which I hope you agree with me, was really terrific, that, 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 that plenary session, is quickly turn into policy questions. It's fun, and another risk of having a bunch of academics is we can play with the data all day long. Um, and, and the Fed, of course, we've never, we've never met a number we didn't like. Um, so um, so we, we run the risk of just going off on the data and just you know having a big data conversation. But the real question I think that I'd like to tease out of this is, so what does the data really mean? W w from policy and, and practice, practitioner perspective, what does it really mean? So um, for the benefit of our panelists, um, I, I didn't tell them I was going to do this, but I always want to know this. It's always helpful to know who's in the room. So I thought just kind of from a show of hands perspective, if you could just, uh, I, I sort of roughly broke into four categories. Public sector, which would include either local, federal, uh, throw the regulators in there. Um, and then the second category is sort of nonprofit foundation. And then the third is any type of for-profit, including financial institutions and other. And then we'll do another, just in case I miss somebody. So can you raise your hand if you're in the public sector or regulatory? Okay, pretty good. What about nonprofit foundation? Okay. Any kind of for-profit or financial? Good. Okay. Anything that I missed? Other? Okay. All right. So anyway, that gives you a sense of, of kind of who's your audience here. Um, like we did, like we always do, we'll make sure to take time to, to bring questions. So as you're hearing from folks, if you could be thinking of what to say, and then, and then we'll have at least 30 minutes on that. Um, so I think with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going um, to go ahead and let John come up. When we were talking on the phone, he was talking about some work he's done. I'm going to let you speak for yourself on this. But, but just in a nutshell, um, John, you know, in, in his role, he's um, the chair 
uh, of urban and regional planning uh, here at, at Penn um, and, and just has a lot of interesting um, data that he's going to show you. Then after that, Raphael um, is uh, at USC um, doing some really terrific work and before that was head of policy development and research at HUD. And then Dick can talk a little bit about his um, the outfit he's at. Um, he's the president of Ecostat, um, but also um, has as an economist and also has a role um, teaching both in business and public policy. I think I'll leave it at that for the bios, but there are more detailed stuff in the packet. So with that, um, why don't we have John come up and we can go ahead and kick it off. And the reason why they're not sitting at the panel is because they want to be able to see the slides too. So I think I'm going to do the same. Thank you, Joseph. And uh, I'm actually a, a, a late addition to this panel, so I want to thank my fellow panelists as well as uh, Joseph for uh, adding me. Um, I'm really looking forward. This is the first time I presented this material, so I'm sort of trying it out on you. Uh, sorry, uh, you didn't sign up to be a, a guinea pig. Um, the, the title of the, the con of the conference session is uh, Changing Housing Markets. I'm not going to focus so much on housing markets as uh, I am on the topic of neighborhood change, particularly neighborhood change in the largest 70 metropolitan areas. Areas uh, in the U.S. between 1990 and uh, 2010. So this data is a little old, but not not too old, as, as we'll see. Um, first, I want to start off with this sort of the idea of narratives. You know, uh, uh, the, the, well, when we're talking about change, we largely depend on on the media, um, and the media has decided that the change du jour is gentrification. So you can't log on to a, a website today or read a newspaper uh, without finding out that gentrification has uh, come to your hometown. Uh, here's a Federal Reserve study um, saying that Boston leads the nation in gentrification, uh, not to be outdone. I used to live in Oakland, California once upon a time, uh, which apparently has become um, the new Brooklyn. Um, part of the appeal of this is that the, uh, you know, the media is headquartered in New York and uh, the Internet is headquartered in San Francisco, so it's not too surprising that they would tell the narratives uh, of, their, uh, of their hometown. But even here in uh, Philadelphia, where we, we have a future media giant, Comcast, uh, uh, gentrification has become um, uh, the big uh, topic uh, of the day. Uh, and and it, people are talking about both sides. Uh, most people have decided that gentrification is problematic, but um, many of the people who live in gentrified neighborhoods um, have decided uh, it's not um, so bad. Um, and lastly, just in, by way of introduction, uh, even though the topic of the day seems to be gentrification as the dominant form of uh, neighborhood change, uh, this is a, a, a pretty new interpretation. In fact, if you go back um, 40 or 50 years, you see the dominant concern was not improving or upgrading urban neighborhoods. Uh, but up until about 10 years ago, the dominant concern was really neighborhood decline. And no better, and, and there's no better place to see that than the story of, of New York over the last 40 years, where uh, it wasn't until 1990 where the first hints of neighborhood upgrading uh, came to be seen. And then they uh, came to be seen um, very strongly. And then most recently, you know, um, we're talking about basically all of New York gentrified. And, and Philadelphia becoming a low-cost alternative to New York. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, all of this sort of the, the dominant narrative got me thinking, well, what's going on? And what's really going on in, in all 70 metropolitan areas is some combination of neighborhood upgrading and neighborhood decline. Um, and it's been going on for 40 years. Even in the last, you know, 40 years ago, there were some neighborhoods in many locations that were upgrading. It's not a completely new thing. And even today, when everybody's talking about gentrification, um, there are some neighborhoods that are declining. So what I want to do um, today, today in my, what, 12 minutes remaining, or maybe 10, uh, is give you sort of the big picture of what's happening in America's uh, urban and suburban neighborhoods in the largest metropolitan area. I'll start by opening up with the four questions I'm going to answer or try to answer, um, and then get to answers uh, on uh, each of them and conclude with some policy guidance. Uh, so the first question, very simple, is uh, looking at all that data that we have access to and the Fed has access to and you have access to, can we come up with some pretty consistent measures of the magnitude of gentrification, or not just gentrification, but neighborhood change in the largest metropolitan areas? Uh, so can we come up with some measures of how 
uh, urban and suburban neighborhoods are changing. Second question, to what extent are those changes a top-down phenomena where it's really the health of the metropolitan area that's determining what's happening in neighborhoods? So if the metropolitan area is on the upswing, its neighborhoods might be on the upswing. If it's, on the, if it's descending, um, its neighborhoods might be. So to what extent is local change driven by metropolitan change versus the third and perhaps the most interesting question, which is to what extent is neighborhood change driven by individual agents working at the neighborhood level, level, by developers, by speculators, by households, who aren't so much concerned with their metropolitan area, but concerned with opportunities for their own improvement at their neighborhood level. So to what extent is, is neighborhood change really a grassroots phenomena? And the final and perhaps the most important question, to what extent is neighborhood change consistently um, associated with uh, displacement. So I'm going to try and answer those all pretty quickly. Uh, the first is, is it possible to come up with a, a robust approach to measuring not just gentrification, but gentrification in other types of neighborhood change across all U.S. metropolitan areas? And the approach I use is something I'm going to call the 3D double decile double decile difference method. It's a mouthful, but basically it says you have a starting period, in this case 1990, you have a, an ending period, in this case 2010, this comes from cens census data, and you organize all the census tracts in a metropolitan area into decils, a little, a little bit like what Raj did this morning. Now this is not all the census tracts nationally, this is all the census tracts in a metropolitan area, and see how they changed over those 20 years. So in the first, in the top example, we're looking at census tract 101, and in 1990, it had a median household income of 17,000, and in 2010, it had a median income of 42,000. And you can see from this illustration, it jumped two or more deciles in that 20-year period in terms of median income. So I'm going to call that upgrading. Okay, if if a census tract jumps two or more deciles, I'm going to call that upgrading, neighborhood or census tract upgrading. And you can see from the, the second, the lower graphic, if a census tract declined two or more deciles, I'm going to call that neighborhood decline. Okay, so for each census tract, I'm going to locate in this metropolitan area, see if it jumped up two or more deciles, that's upgrading. If it fell two or more deciles, that's decline. Now, this method has a whole bunch of pros and cons. Its big downside um, is that it looks solely at incomes. It's not looking at rents or prices or other metrics that we have, although we could do that. Its big upside is it's simple and you can apply it in the same way. And again, it locates each census tract in its own metropolitan area. Uh, it doesn't compare it to some sort of phantom national trend. Um, then we ask the question, well, what's the difference between upgrading and gentrification? And I'm going to define gentrification as if you start in the fourth, third, second, or first decile and you jump up two or more income deciles, I'm going to call that gentrification. So if you start low and go two or more deciles higher, I'm going to call that gentrification. Now, again, this applies only to income. Um, the usual identification of gentrification is includes a socioeconomic upgrading, it includes a physical upgrading in the form of the housing stock, and it also includes um, a, a, an unusual displacement or turnover. So usually three characteristics of gentrification, socioeconomic upgrading, physical upgrading, and then heightened turnover. I'm, so I'm going to find gentrification as two or more decile increase starting in the fourth decile or lower. And I'm also going to divide this into core or central city areas versus suburban tracks. Um, this just shows how we do it. Uh, here's some, just some pictures. You may not be able to make, make this out. Green is uh, uh, upgrading. Uh, just some examples of uh, metropolitan areas that have had a lot of, um, uh, have reputed to have had a lot of um, uh, gentrification. The first is uh, Boston. You may not be able to make this out. These are census tract maps, but you can see the CBD. The green is gentrification. The red is decline. The second is the gentrification capital of the U.S. where they stone the Ruble bus, um, which is San Francisco. And again, that's in the middle. Sorry. And the third is uh, Seattle, another place you heard about the, uh, uh, a few minutes ago. And again, you can see in even the places where there's a lot of gentrification, there's also uh, neighborhoods are also um, declining. So what we did was we totaled up the 1990 populations in each of these classifications to try and get a count of how, how much 
how many people are in these neighborhoods that are gentrifying? So this is the before population counts. It's not that different than if we did the after population counts. And the graphic on the left, if you look at the light blue, that's upgrading, and you add the core area upgrading, which is at the top, with the suburban upgrading, which is down a little below or a little lower, you get about six percent of the 1990 population of the U.S. was, uh, I'm sorry, of the 70 largest metropolitan areas, was located in neighborhoods that over the next 25 years would would experience substantial income upgrading. That's five to six percent. Um, about three percent of the population of these 70 largest metropolitan areas were located in areas, either suburban or core, that would gentrify between 1990 or um, 2010. Uh, and uh, uh, altogether, about 20 percent were located in metropolitan areas that would continue declining between 1990 and 2010. So the big takeaway here. Um, just looking at the first, um, uh, the left-hand side, uh, is that although gentrification is much in the news these days, it's only about uh, it's only about three percent of the population of the largest metropolitan areas lives in neighborhoods that gentrify. Three or four percent, about six seven percent lives in upgrading areas. Um, and uh, about 20% lives in decline. So despite what the New York Times and Google tells you about gentrification being the dominant phenomenon, at least between 1990 and 2010, neighborhood decline um, continued, uh, neighborhood income decline um, continued to be a problem. I'll, I'll make this uh, presentation available. There's a lot more to lo uh, look at here, um, but I want to look at the leaders, um, and this is the uh, top 10 metros um, in terms of upgrading. Okay, I can see I'm running out of um, uh, information, uh, running out of things uh, very quickly, so I'm just going to show you uh, very quickly what were the, um, between 1990 and 2010, um, in terms of upgrading, Seattle, Columbia, Tampa, Chicago, those were the top core area upgrading, and but upgrading happened in the suburbs too, Bakersfield, McAllen, Tulsa. If we want to just focus on gentrification, again, some places you normally don't think about, this is not number of people, but it's the percent of the population. Um, gentrification leaders were Columbia, Tampa, Seattle, again, familiar, Stockton. It's, it, it's, a, it's a widespread phenomenon, even if it's not um, all that common. And, gentrif and gentrification was also happening in the suburbs. Again, you can see uh, mostly uh, in the Sun Belt it happened. Here's, again, decline. Now, what's, what's misleading about this is, is look at the, the um, x-axis, and you can see that uh, Las Vegas, uh, Grand Rapids, Orlando, uh, this was largely due to the melt, uh, the um, bursting of the subprime sub bubble, um, but you can see substantial increases, and in almost every case uh, among the leaders, uh, decline is present uh, two to three, four times uh, the amount of gentrification. Very quickly, what affects um, uh, these amounts? Uh, when we look across metropolitan areas, uh, what affects uh, these amounts. We ran some regression models, and I'm not going to bore you with the results, except to tell you just a few correlations of the type that Raj talked about this morning. If you want to understand what uh, encourages, I'll just deal with the top, the core, what encourages more at the regional level or metropolitan level, what encourages more core area upgrade, upgrading. We looked at about 25 uh, different variables, and the only variable that we could find that was associated with core area upgrading activity, only regional variable in this period, was the presence of an urban containment um, uh, line uh, tended to focus uh, uh, population growth from the fringes uh, back toward the core. Uh, uh, the green shows gentrification, again, the uh, presence of an urban containment line um, uh, and if we look at the core area declining population, which is the dominant, again, de decline remains the dominant mode here of neighborhood change, what was, effect, what was encouraging uh, decline, again, across the 70 largest metropolitan areas? Population growth. Unorganized population growth was, at the metropolitan level, was um, associated with decline, uh, and there were some other effects due to density uh, and uh, income. So that's sort of the top-down view, but the, the story here is that neighborhood change is not primarily a top-down phenomenon. If any, any econometricians here, you can see that those R-squared values are pretty low. So, so neighborhood change is not primarily being shaped at the metropolitan level, although it's fair to say that decline at the metropolitan level shapes, affects 
decline at the neighborhood level more than the metropolitan upgrading. I just want to jump to the, 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 the um, uh, here's my Doonesbury cartoon from 1997, which predates gentrification. But like most things in Doonesbury, does anybody even read Doonesbury anymore? You still should. He got it right. Gary Trudeau got it right. At the neighborhood level, what are the factors most associated with upgrading gentrification and decline? Lots here. I'm just going to, um, and in some ways this conforms with, to what you might think. Um, the tracks, uh, and there were over 40,000 tracks that we looked at, um, the tracks that were most likely to upgrade uh, between 2000 and two, and, uh, 1990 and 2010 uh, were those that started with a reasonably uh, um, strong uh, apartment market, um, those that had a high proportion of college-educated residents, and those that had a high initial proportion of whites. The tracks jumping over to the right-hand side that were more likely to decline um, were those that were um, further away from the central business district. Those closer to the central business district tended to be upgraded. Uh, and those that had a, a dominance of either single family or multifamily unit. So it's really about a balanced housing stock. And lastly, and because I only have one minute um, to go, and I can talk about policy implications a little bit later, the, the, the key question, to what extent what was a neighborhood trajectory or a neighborhood outcome associated with higher levels of displacement. The Census Bureau does not measure displacement, unfortunately, maybe it should, but it does measure turnover. And if you say, what's the correlation between one year turnover and uh, either um, neighborhood upgrading or decline, uh, it, if you just look at decline versus upgrading and turnover, uh, there are slightly higher levels of turnover um, in uh, upgrading tracks. Um, I'm sorry, there are slightly lower levels of turnover in upgrading tracks. That's the minus 0.02, slightly higher levels of turnover in declining tracks. Um, so it's actually decline that propels more turnover and ultimately, I think, displacement than um, upgrading. But if you control for the characteristics of the track, those effects disappear. So looking across the 70 largest metropolitan area, there are certainly places where gentrification and upgrading are associated with uh, displacement and turnover. But uh, on the whole, systematically, there doesn't appear to be an overall relationship. I'd be happy to take questions and talk about policy a little bit later. Thank you again for the opportunity to talk with you. Okay, Ra Raphael's going to get his uh, presentation queued up while he's doing that. I have to tell everybody, um, so Raphael's plane uh, was delayed, and so he got in. Oh, don't was do it, that. Don't do was that. Was it 4 in the morning? Was it, it 5 was in the morning? It was he's had at least an hour of sleep, so uh, if, he, if he nods yeah. off in the middle of this, you know, you'll, you'll know why. Um, and then what we'll be doing is um, we'll be taking questions for all three panelists at the end, so we'll just run and keep the flow. So with that, Raphael. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, good to see you. Good to be here. It's a pleasure to be part of this conference and to be on a panel with two really, uh, really strong researchers who uh, I always seem to learn from. So it's good to be here. Um, I also want to say that uh, Joe started off the session by asking a couple of questions. How has the housing market changed? What is, the, what is an older community and uh, what are interesting segments? I was going to speak to none of them. So um, I'm actually going to add a few things here, which means I'll subtract some things to stay to the 15 minutes. Um, and, and I wanted to, um, to really uh, piggyback on what John uh, was talking about in terms of thinking about uh, what creates the dynamic changes that we see in neighborhoods. And I, I want to focus my remarks uh, on the question of uh, to what extent is it housing that is a barrier or a catalyst for these changes, and, and how should we think about housing uh, in its role? So um, what I'm going to do is, is really start to talk about this in the context of housing historically. And uh, the real punchline here is that housing has changed, uh, but that change started in the 60s and 70s uh, and not in the, the 90s and 2000s. And what we saw in the 90s and 2000s was sort of a stronger version of it uh, and a version that didn't actually play out evenly across the country, and that, that uh, is important for how we think about reinventing older communities. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about what's seen, just to highlight where some of the stresses are in the marketplace, and, and really try to make the point here that uh, 
the stress is everywhere. Uh, and that when we think about housing, uh, most focus has been on uh, ownership markets, uh, but the rental markets is where a lot of the action is, uh, and I think it's a lot of what's driving uh, some of the things that John's seeing. Uh, I'm going to say very little about, about what's been learned um, because I think that'll be left for the, the end, uh, and um, I think you guys might have as many insights as, as we do. So, so that's where we are. But to start, uh, I, 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 I'm going to do this in a, in a way I do in California. So we're going to do some yoga. Uh, we're going to have some, some, some L.A. statistics. But, but I, I really like to start talking about housing markets by recognizing that when we talk about housing, it is in the context of it is a foundation upon which we build everything else that we do. And then when people are housed well, uh, they, are, they will do better in other areas. And so when we think about the original housing con contract, uh, it was you buy a house, you stay in it for 30 years, you, uh, you uh, live in, work with your company town, you have your, your long experience in employment, you have a pension, you retire, you have an nest egg, boom, voila, housing is wonderful. Right? And that is the contract that, that most Americans operated with really through the mid-1990s. Uh, and then things changed, and then they really changed to where we got into a place where uh, housing was no longer a source of balance, but rather it was a source of imbalance. Uh, and when that imbalance happened, it led us to, to hopefully rethink. It's caused many people to rethink about what, what it means uh, to, to be housed and, and how should we think about housing. And so the contract around housing uh, is changing, right? And it's changed with the broader economy and how it's changed in, in terms of production. The notion of any of us working with the same company for 35 years and retiring with the company that we had our first job with is not, I don't think anyone carries that anymore. And that has implications for what good decisions are in terms of, of housing, how should we think about it, and how should we move forward. That contract has changed pretty fundamentally, uh, and it's led to all sorts of problems. Uh, the problems uh, that we are most sensitive to happened around 2006, 2007. This was something that I spent a lot of time uh, working on when I was in Washington, trying to deal with this. Uh, and it really l led to a, a crisis in housing markets. That crisis persists today. Right? So we're still seven, eight years out. Uh, and we still have challenges in just about every dimension of housing. So there's a foreclosure issue, and uh, what you'll see in most uh, headlines these days is that foreclosures are down. Uh, what we don't say in those headlines is that foreclosures used to be zero, and down from a large number is still a large number, and non-zero. Right? So there is a lot of distress that's still in the marketplace. It is still uh, a market that is, that is difficult to handle. Through the course of the crisis, trillions of dollars of home equity was lost. Uh, for many households, that was all of their equity, it was all of their wealth. Uh, and though we've seen recovery, that recovery has not nearly eliminated uh, the negative equity problem. So there's still tens of thousands of families across this country uh, that are facing negative equity. Uh, and that means that tens of thousands of families in this country are on the cusp of default and delinquency. One bad uh, spell, one bad event, uh, and they could, it, uh, the cards could fall uh, considerably. Uh, and then there's neighborhood level instability, and this is perhaps one of the more important aspects when we think about uh, older communities, uh, but the reality is foreclosures didn't happen everywhere, right? And they wound up concentrating in particular neighborhoods. In California, uh, those were lar m largely suburban places on the fringe, uh, people were trying to buy bigger houses. In other parts of the country, in the Midwest, um, they were not in those places. They were in the core. They were in those, those neighborhoods that used to be the vital drivers of wealth building for lower income and minority neighborhoods. And um, that trouble is still with us. Uh, as, and I'll show you some, some things uh, to make that case. So we've seen recovery. We've seen the, the market start to... Uh, the prices have not, are no longer in free fall. They're starting to move up. In L.A., uh, people are asking, are we in a second bubble? Um, that is not usually the thing you hear in uh, Pittsburgh or Detroit or Buffalo. Uh, but that stability, what, what should we think about the stability is something that I think we, we all need to grapple with in terms of driving policy. Uh, 
I think an important aspect in terms of thinking of, uh, oh, let me just say, when we think about the recovery, there are really two realities. And, and when we think about recovery in older cities and cities that have older, older communities, there are two realities as well. So I just uh, plotted some of the uh, house price trajectories uh, across different regions of the country. Uh, and I tried to keep these on the same axis so you can actually see uh, the, 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 the relative differences in experiences. So this is the middle of the country. This is the Midwest, the Plains, uh, and going down into some of the, the Gulf Coast areas. And what you see here is nothing that would suggest uh, free fall or crisis or dramatic, dramatic changes of the sort that uh, we, we heard headlines about for, uh, for five years. Uh, certainly there were difficulties here, but, uh, but th we saw slower growth. This was slower pace on the way up, slower on the way down, uh, and the recovery has been relatively slight. Right? And this is in all of our areas. The Midwest, the Midwestern states, the near Midwestern states, the Eastern Midwestern states are the worst. Uh, but that, they, they've been lagging behind for quite some time. Right? And so this is all a matter of degree and not necessarily a change in, in a general experience. This is what happens in the coastal areas and in the mountain states. Right? This is where the dynamic is, and this is where uh, the big change is. But when we think about older places, you know, the mid-Atlantic states have some of those places. Right? So now we have to think, when we think about our policy prescriptions, we have to recognize that we really have two different realities here. For some places, this was a slow, pla slow experience. It, it's just part and parcel of a long secular change in how the economy has performed, the struggles that people have had. In other places, they're being swept up and down by a much more volatile and vibrant economy. And how we think about that integration is going to be quite different than how we're going to want to think about it in, uh, in some of the near Midwestern places. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. The last thing I want to talk about um, in this context is rental markets. Uh, because um, economists used to, well, economists think we know everything about every market, so I'll just start with that. Uh, but, but the reality is when uh, the housing crisis happened, uh, there was a general belief that um, we would release all of these units into the marketplace and that would translate into happy days for rental markets. Uh, the extra supply would mean people would have lots of places to live and we would be in a better place. And that just hasn't really borne out. Um, in many markets, particularly in the coastal markets, uh, what is, what's, what's actually happened is that the people who have lost their homes through foreclosures become competitors for uh, a fixed set of rental markets. And prices are going up in exactly the places where foreclosure is high. But when we think about the rental market, and this is, again, another important dy dynamic when we, uh, about uh, housing markets, uh, when, I, when, I do, when I talk about rental markets back in L.A., I try to talk about it in terms of affordability, right? And um, affordability, uh, it, it's improved dramatically. Uh, what we saw through 2005 was that uh, we were maintaining affordability by using all those crazy um, mortgage instruments so we could keep our payments down. Uh, once they went away, our monthly payments were going to go through the roof, so affordability uh, fell, fell quickly. Uh, but in the last year or two, we've seen a significant decline in that affordability, significant uh, improvement in that affordability. So we're, we're doing better. Uh, but that has not translated into rental markets. So what I've shown, what I show in LA is what ha what's happened to the incomes of renters, and then what's happened to rents, right? So, and these are this is a paper that's in the Cityscape Journal by Rob Collins, and I love this. It's very simple, straightforward. Uh, and what we see here is that in most California markets, uh, the the real income for renters has fallen over the last 20 years, somewhere on the order of six to seven percent in real real dollars. Uh, now, I, I explained before that the older communities are not all Los Angeles. Actually, none of them are Los Angeles. You don't have Donald Sterling. You don't have OJ. There lots of things you don't have uh, that make headlines. Uh, but, but what is true is that some of these dynamics are exactly the same, and in, in some instances, more extreme. When we think about renter incomes, 
Uh, here in, in the Western states, no MSAs, uh, none of the major MSAs saw incomes fall less than 10% in real terms. Uh, when we think about some of our older cities and older communities, that is not true. Detroit, Milwaukee, Cleveland, Minneapolis, Philadelphia, the renters' incomes in real terms have fallen by greater than 10% over 20 years, straight lined out. There's serious distress in these populations. And if you think about that are less than, have fallen more than 5%, you add in Chicago, Cincinnati, St. Louis, Boston, New York City, Pittsburgh, basically everywhere, renters are seeing significant declines in their incomes. All right, now what's happened to rents? In the West Coast, the rents are up, somewhere on the order of about 20% over the same period of time. So incomes go down in real terms, rents go up. That's hard, right? That's hardship for everyone. Um, in the Northeast, the dynamic is pretty much the same as in, in the West, right? So in the rental markets in the Northeast, we have these challenges. Um, in the Midwest, the rents don't go up nearly this much. They go up about 4%. But 4% up on 12% down still is increasing distress and, and, and difficulties. Pittsburgh, Detroit, and St. Louis are really the only ones that see this kind of um, uh, some sort of equilibration between the decline in rents and the decline in income. All right. Now, I do another set of pictures that are in this presentation I'm going to skip, uh, but really ask the question about what's the source of this rental market difficulty. In coastal markets, Part of it is inadequate supply. We don't have enough units, right? And so in those places, the actual functioning of the housing market is a barrier to people finding opportunities because the housing market is not doing what it needs to do. Uh, in the Midwest and other places, supply is really not an issue, right? And there's a table in there that shows that uh, if you think of, look at the number of units that are affordable and available to lower income people, it's, for every 100, it's somewhere between 85 and 115, right? So it's not a crisis. In L.A., for example, the number is like 30, right? So, so it's really qualitatively different in terms of how these markets play out. And so when we think about, oh, I should stay here. This, this AI, you see L.A. is 25 and 30, uh, 36, right? That's quite different uh, as, as we play these markets out. And so when we think about the solutions and, and the policies that need to be put in place, housing is not going to be uh, the market that you're going to focus on in sort of Midwestern cities, right? Fixing the housing market in and of itself is not going to be a panacea. In fact, it, it, this argues that, uh, that income is going to be far more important, finding jobs, a lot of the stuff that was discussed in the, the opening plenary. Uh, it, those are the things we need to focus on. There are a set of these older cities, however, where we need to think about how do we get more housing just so that the markets are functioning smoothly and in an equilibrium level or something close to equilibrium. Because without that, then housing becomes a barrier, a real barrier to progress, a barrier to transformation, a barrier for people to realize new, uh, new differences. Now, while I said that housing isn't a... Um, isn't a barrier in the Midwestern cities. I do think it's important to keep in mind, I should move this microphone before I knock it off. Uh, it is important to keep in mind that housing can be a catalyst uh, to help other efforts move forward. So while we don't need to view housing as something that is frontline, front and center, first thing to do in those places, if we can find ways to have our housing complement the other efforts that are going on, it can make them even more effective. Right, so housing should be part of the story, but in a very different way in those places than in the places that, um, that are on the more coastal places. All right, so this is the foundation that housing was built upon in the, 19, in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Right, something that was relatively unsteady and that with a good breeze or something, you could topple over. And really what we're trying to do is transition to a place where a foundation for housing, where people get housed well, uh, is something that's firm and steady and solid, so that as people move forward and live their lives, um, housing is not a barrier, is not a problem, but is something that can be a springboard for them to move forward. I usually end with two quotes. Um, the only thing to take from these is that um, I'm as optimistic 
as uh, as the speakers in the first in the plenary. Um, I think that uh, Raj Chetty and his comments about what can be done in education uh, were, were spot on, and I believe that we can do similar things uh, with housing markets to help promote and improve people's uh, lives and make these places vibrant again. So thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Dick Voith, um, president of a small company called Consult Solutions. We do work on urban economics um, in the Middle Atlantic and a lot of places. I used to be at the Philadelphia Fed, a terrific place, um, just the best, um, huge fan. Um, following um, these two presentations is a challenge. I think that the framing of the issue that both speakers um, put forth is just really interesting. And what I'm going to say, um, I don't think is going to contradict much at all what they, the, the framing that they've put, put forth, but it's going to have a substantially different perspective. Um, John focused at a very micro level of neighborhoods uh, at the census tract and looked at change. Uh, which is a very interesting way, way to look at it, and then he tried to explain that change with data. Raphael took a different view and looked at overall the housing rental market and the, house, the ownership market and the issues associated with income and how those are creating problems that may be barriers to neighborhood revitalization. I'm going to take a little different um, perspective on this. Um, and it's a little more optimistic in many respects, although I don't think it um, really solves any of the problems that Raphael identified, um, per se. But really, in my, in my view, that there's a lot of information. I, I should take a step back and say, a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about here is done in a paper that uh, with Susan Wachter and myself and Arthur Akoka. Um, and so they deserve a lot of credit for this. Um, but basically, in our view, the secular decline in U.S. cities uh, has, by and large, run their course, run its course. Cities are now more competitive with suburbs. Um, you basically, there's a lot of forces that um, are that are happening now that allow cities to uh, prosper. It doesn't mean they will prosper, but the conditions have changed. And also, I think importantly, there is a change in perception from cities. Um, if you looked at movies in the 1990s, you saw, or in the 1980s, movies like Escape from New York, right? In the 2000s, Sex in the City, it's now an old show, but the cities have at least associated a level of glamour with them, which just wasn't the case when I was growing up. I, I grew up through 40 years, 40 years of urban decline. Um, and that has, these factors have real effects for housing markets. If you look at, this is a map, I don't know whether it shows up real well on that slide or not. Um, this is a map that basically shows growth rates and purely just in population in cities. And if you look at the Midwest, northern, north central area, or places that Raphael uh, identified as real problematic, those places are still in decline. But older cities, um, in the U.S., um, in the Northeast, in the West, in most places in the country, really um, have ceased their systematic decline. Philadelphia, which lost a quarter of its population, now is not losing population. And if you look at um, central city growth in population, you'll take a really short point of view. The last couple of years, not 2010 to 2012, cities in the U.S., of the, of the large cities in the U.S. grew at roughly the same rate that their suburbs grew. That's sort of unprecedented in the first half, uh, the second half of the 20th century. Um, if you look in between 1950 and 1980, 18 of 25 of the largest cities declined in population. 
That's what we were looking at in general. Between 1890 and 2010, at least six of the 25 largest declined in population. There's a secular improvement there. And I think that there's a reason for all of this. And when you, when you really want to think about it, um, I'm going to offer some factors why cities are improving and why cities have a chance to grow. And there's going to be some real implications for neighborhoods. Um, if you look at um, cities and you ask the question of why they declined, well, really, they had to decline. If you look at cities in 1950, they were too dense. They were surrounded by empty suburbs. And the differential in attractiveness between the two was extreme, especially when you considered the fact that we were doing rapid investment in the interstate and other highway systems. Uh, the car was becoming king. We had policies that spur new housing investment. Those things meant that the basically empty suburbs could fill up. And we had changing in technology and manufacturing and transportation as well that said, you don't want multi-story manufacturing facilities. You want to spread them out along the highways. And the decline in cities, uh, population decline, it was purely natu natural in some, re some respects and economically driven because the supply of land was just there and it was taken advantage of by highway investment. Uh, basically caused a vicious cycle of decline, an excessive cycle of decline, because you know what, if you're in a neighborhood and everyone's moving out, what's happening to your asset values, they're going down, you can't get out fast enough. And so basically cities were in a cycle of decline and more decline and more decline. The people who end up remaining in cities tended to be people who were of lower income, fewer options. Glazer and Jer uh, Jerko have a paper that basically says that the process of filtering results in lower human capital people in concentrated in older neighborhoods. And they create fiscal pathologies, difficulties to, to overcome. We had serious racial issues uh, with the migration of uh, African Americans northward and uh, the conflicts between folks of moderate uh, means. So basically, you had, you had to see decline in cities. I, I think there's no question about it. Um, but really, the city's back in many respects, at least in terms of the basic underlying economic forces that are, are driving the world. Suburban land and development costs have increased tremendously. Uh, many jurisdictions and suburbs simply don't want growth. It's a difficult place to develop. Transportation costs have risen, and here I don't mean the gasoline costs have risen. The gasoline costs were high in 1980s too, early, early 80s. Um, but we've created a huge transportation asset funded through a well-funded funding, gas tax mechanism that allowed us to build lots of new roads. We don't seem to be willing to do that much anymore. We are, this huge asset depreciates a certain amount every year. You have to rebuild a highway every 30 years completely. And basically we have enough revenue flowing into our infrastructure to barely maintain it. So we don't have this huge capacity expansion. We're pretty much built out for the time being. Um, so in that sense, we're not adding the ability to expand really quickly. And in addition, older suburbs are starting to confront the same kind of problems that some older cities confront as their housing stock filters down. There's a bunch of challenges. Cities, on the other hand, have made a transition uh, to a more knowledge-based economy. Um, it's something they're good at, they're naturally good at. Um, you know, there's papers that say that technology, cha technology change have favored you know, that favors communication, allows for more meetings, and things that cities actually facilitate. Um, and so you're getting at least more interest in higher skilled people being in the cities. And as the last thing I'll say I alluded to before, you have a whole generation that has now grown up, the millennials, that really grew up in an area of where cities were looked at as the place of opportunity more and more rather than a place of decline. And everyone's heard the demographic story. You know, we have baby boomers moving back to the city. Um, and we also have um, millennials. But you know, when you look at some of the basic facts surrounding that, um, household size has shrunk 
incredibly. It's gone from 3.7 in 1950 to 2.6 in 2010. 27 percent of households are single family, single person households. Um, you have boomers; they're getting older. They want to downsize a certain amount. At least a, small, a fraction of those boomers are interested in potentially the amenities available if they're safe in cities. Um, millennials, who I said really didn't grow up with a widespread urban decline, um, really are a little different, um, and they're also financially a little bit constrained. It's been the economy's been tough on them. They don't drive as much. Um, if you look at people 15 to, uh, 16 to 24, um, many of them, uh, their drive, the percent with a driver's license fell from, let's say, 77% in 1975 to now 65% uh, now. They're, they're behaving a little bit differently. Um, so that benefits um, cities. Cities have alternatives. Millennials seem to value those alternatives. So in many ways, um, perfect neighborhood may no longer be, for many people, a suburban neighborhood. It might be something that's really quite different, um, different, different, different look. And what does it mean for housing? Now, so number one, you know, you can have a, a shift in demand. You're really moving towards smaller units. Transportation, transit access is becoming increasingly important. Um, you know, smaller units with smaller households. Um, less reliance on driving means you have to have some other alternative to way to get around aside from just a bicycle. Um, also means you want to locate closer to uh, nice amenities. So you have some desire to be near transit. Uh, second of all, you have, third of all, you have significantly changed demand for rental units. Um, Millennials uh, end up forcibly in many cases because so they don't have the down payment to go and pursue to purchase their own house. But going back to what Raphael said about uncertainty, if you're uncertain about the housing market, about the return to housing over time, um, about whether you want to put that much investment in a particular place because you may have to move quickly, um, it is something that spurs rental rather than home ownership. And of course, we've seen a you know, significant drop in home ownership demand in a really short time from almost 62, almost 70%, 69.2% uh, in 2004, down to you know, 64 and a half now, I believe, 64.8. So we've seen significant changes in the market there. And really, um, you really need to think that the rental market is um, the play. Well, the rental market has actually responded pretty aggressively in many American cities. You've seen a lot more supply come online, and you're seeing that supply being met with demand of all sorts of folks. Now, one question is um, is whether that demand is going to continue, whether baby boomers you know, they're going to die off and get old, but will the millennials, will they consider, continue to um, stay in cities as they, they age and they start to really form families, even if they're forming families a little late? But at the end of the day, um, cities, I believe, are more competitive, and being more competitive for people means that it's going to have an effect on affordability. Um, no matter what, if cities become more attractive to a broader set of people, um, there's going to be more demand for space, for land in cities. And to the extent that there are significant parts of the population in cities whose incomes were, may have well been suited to uh, uh, purchasing housing when there was less demand for the city, then you're going to have an affordability problem. In fact, Cities, many cities for a long time provide, were a real big source of providing affordable housing for people. Uh, they did it in a kind of a crummy way. I mean, you know, in some respects, a lot of our supplying affordable housing was to make neighborhoods so unattractive that no one wanted to live there. And since they were affordable, it wasn't very high quality housing or a good environment to be in. But um, you were seeing now competition on the edge, and this is going right to the idea of gentrification. And I couldn't agree more that 
about cities being living and dying at the same time. If you look at any city, look at our own city here, Philadelphia, there are many parts of Philadelphia are a boom town with a huge amount of investment. Um, and at the same time, there are sections of the city that are emptying out at a rapid pace um, because they're simply unattractive and people aren't willing to live there because the quality of life is so bad, even at you know, very low prices. Um, so the, the improvement of cities, I think, is going to cause a real affordability challenge. I got one minute left and I will actually manage that. And the affordability challenge um, will be met eventually, one way or another, but the, the, the importance of the issue of affordability and the improvement of cities, nowhere can you see it more uh, dramatically, in, um, but in, New, in de Blasio's New York, New York affordability uh, program. Um, $41 billion, billion dollars. he wants to invest over 10 years. He wants to subsidize uh, affordability in many ways. He also wants to enhance supply, which is uh, an important thing by allowing greater density, more towers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the last thing I want to point out is that, this, is that the focus on the rental market is really not that bad a thing. Uh, many people lament the fact that housing, um, and going back to Raphael's argument, that the stability of the housing market worked perfectly well for many generations, um, and there was a way to accumulate wealth, et cetera, et cetera. But if you take the long view of it, as Bob Schiller's done, um, the real return, the real increase in housing prices over 120 years is 0.25 percent per year. So a lot of the gains, um, if you're a millennial, you'll see you see huge fluctuations up and down. Number one, so the risk is there, and so maybe you just don't want to jump into those markets like you would did uh, 30 years ago when there was more certainty about where you're going to be in your, your future 25 years. So I will end there. Um, it's been a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you. Okay, I'm going to ask the panel to, to get seated at the at the table here, and then we're going to. Um, we, this panel ends at um, 3:30, so we have um, 30 minutes basically to, ask, to answer all of your questions, as well as to give each of our panelists, our presenters, a chance to react to each other's. So I'm really just going to ask maybe one question, and, and you know, um, maybe you can start, Raphael. We can just kind of go down. One is. Um, from the perspective of any kind of policymaker in the room, whether they be at the federal level, state, or local, um, is there anything that you would suggest based on either what you said or what, what any of your colleagues have said that would be something for them to think about, um, you know, just from a policy prescri prescription standpoint? Um, they'd be very interested in that because, I mean, a lot of people come to this conference for ideas as to sort of, well, what works? Um, what should they try? Um, so that may be kind of a, a question. Maybe we'll start with that, and, and you know, if others want to take a crack at that, and then maybe we can have uh, there's a few others. That was to me. Yeah, if you don't mind. If you, I mean, you know, having, having been in Washington policy circles, any perspectives on it? Again, it doesn't have to be at the federal level, it can be the state or local, but I'd just be very interested in any perspectives you have on it. with these dynamics. Well, you know, what, what, yeah, what exactly. What are the policymakers doing? So I think there are a couple of things. Um, the first is for the policymaker. Policymakers really need to. Okay, so yeah. multiple levels. Federal government. Um, the challenge with the federal government is to de design a program that's sufficiently flexible so that different realities can leverage the resources that are available in the program. All right, we saw, we saw you take a CDBG type program. Um, that has a great amount of flexibility, um, and it allows for the tailoring of uh, strategies to match what's, what's local. NSP... Um, when it was f the neighborhood stabilization program, when it was first established, it wasn't sufficiently flexible for some of the older cities, the Detroits and the Flints, that needed to do significant demolition, right? And so we needed to find ways to, to broaden these programs to make sure that they in incorporate the full range of uh, activities that might make sense for, for localities. At the local level, I think that um, the biggest uh, thing that policymakers need to do is really understand the nature of their problem, uh, have a consensus about where they're trying to go, and, and take a real stock about where the potential assets are. Um, strategies moving forward uh, 
Uh, and I think that last point is really important. Uh, the strategies moving forward need to leverage existing assets uh, and not deal exclusively with existing with the, the challenges and the problems because the assets are where things are going to grow and blossom and develop uh, and move forward. And then um, uh, President Plosser's comment about uh, trying to do a little reading of the crystal ball to acknowledge uh, where the puck is likely to be in three or five years uh, is important. Now, it's going to be very difficult to pick an industry. Right? I, I don't think that's, that's the right strategy. But we do have some good sense about where skill sets are evolving uh, and uh, can try to make sure that the workforce evolves in that way. Um, and you know, some of that, I guess almost all of that was beyond housing in, in, in some sense. But I think in many of the places that we're talking about, you know, housing is just one piece of the, the puzzle. And to only look at it as a housing piece, I think, is, is not helpful. I think what, what de Blasio is doing in New York is it was interesting. Um, to try to increase supply, inclusionary stuff, all those uh, leveraging transit-oriented development uh, to increase densities. These are strategies that I think uh, just about every place can leverage. Um, so for the other two, before I turn over to the audience, and so I'll be thinking about your questions, because I wanted to really devote the bulk of the time we have to you, um, but I'd be interested in either if the other two of you have any comments on what, any, what you heard from any of your fellow panelists, if you want to raise a question, raise a challenge. Um, you know, I think it's always interesting to have a little give and take, so maybe we give you a chance well, to do that. Well, Joseph, let me see if I can answer your policy questions. I think it's, first of all, I'm, I'll just be contentious and say I, I, I'm not sure there really is a big role for uh, the federal government. Um, I'm, I'm going to attack Congress and not the Obama administration because um, Raphael was in the Obama administration and I think he was you a good You attack me, that's fine. Sanity. <laughs> um, I think in 2008, 2009, um, Congress and to a certain extent the federal government had a chance to step up uh, on the housing market and they just punted and they haven't stepped up since. And so I'm, you know, maybe the pup will change in that world, but I'm not expecting. I really do think that people like de Blasio have understood that the, the responsibility is going to be in their court and in places like Philadelphia, Los Angeles. And I wish the federal government could provide additional resources, but I'm not going to wait for that. Um, let me say a few things about policy about gentrification. Um, gentrification is not as, you know, as large, I think, as, as people tend to feel, but it is real and it does adversely affect low-income renters by far the most. They suffer disproportionately. Um, so uh, rather than uh, try and stop gentrification, um, the answer is uh, more general supply uh, because filtering does work to some extent, but also more targeted solutions that help meet the needs of, uh, of uh, low-income renters in particular. There are about four or five solutions that can work pretty effectively. And, and again, Raphael was a, an advocate of many of those um, um, solutions when he was at HUD. But I also think that the suburbs are going to continue to face uh, opportunities, but also continuing challenges. Uh, particularly those uh, suburban communities that uh, were developed in the 1950s and 1960s um, that uh, have had uh, a lot of social instability as well as a lot of uh, workplace instability. And uh, those are the ones that if, if we want to sort of practice uh, uh, preventative planning to, to maintain, uh, those are the ones we should focus on. So if I could take a quick stab at this. One of the things that's really important to realize about neighborhoods and affordability is there is a really big income problem. Uh, we need to make sure that we provide decent education across all of our communities and that we address human capital problems. It's not all a housing problem. I think that we all understand this at some level. Uh, I also want to echo John's comment about supply. Um, filtering is an important phenomenon. You put, you put more houses on the market even if they're high-end houses, it eventually is an increase in supply and it affects all tiers of the market. Now, that is, and I think that's an incredibly important thing that a bunch of com communities often miss and it's clearly not well understood amongst the general public. Uh, however, I don't think supply is everything either and I, th I really do think it, that a large measure of the ability to deal with the affordability problem, which is a real problem for the work, called working poor, um, as cities become more attractive, 
uh, they are going to be constrained, and you need non-market efforts to do that, whether they're ex inclusionary zoning, or whether they're deed-restricted housing, or any one number, one, uh, number of solutions. They're all difficult, they're all inefficient, but they're also probably all necessary. That's just my opinion. So can I, I, I'm, I'm interested in this filtering idea because I don't think it actually happens very much. Uh, you know, when, when we think about um, adding supply, right, in many of these places, the amount of imbalance is so large that 100 units here or 100 units there just doesn't fundamentally change the, the cost dynamic. Right? And you know, if you did the surplus, a thousand units every year, you would eventually get there. That'd be 25 years down the road, right? But that does not help us today. And I think one of the things that, that's, that's difficult is that we, got, we have a short run problem that we have to figure out how to deal with. It's going to take some dramatic things. The challenge, and I actually agree with you, John, also on the fact the federal government is not going to discover you know, $40 billion. I mean, in the history of our housing policy, the federal government has never stepped up and said we're going to make sure everyone is housed well. They've never said that, right? They said we'd like to say that, but they never said it. I don't even think they'd like to say that. I mean, <laughs> if push came to shove, you know, we'd like to say that. We'd, we wish they would say that, but, but you know, they don't. And so, so I, I think that, that we've got to find other pathways. You know, to me, um, the, one of the biggest federal government roles is going to be information. Right. They can be a convener and find things that are working in far-flung parts of the country and let everybody know about it. They have that platform. Uh, I think the Federal Reserve, um, philanthropy, you know, those are other institutions. You know, we, we talk a lot at, at SC about you know, the idea that policy more and more is not going to be just public sector doing it. Right? And actually, most of you people out here I guess we have a lot of regulators here, so maybe you think you are do doing it. But, but, the, but the reality is that, um, that the nonprofits are doing this, private companies are doing this. This is something that's become an all-hands-on-deck situation. And we've got to find um, a consistent model for, for getting all-hands-on-deck, right? And so we th you heard people talk about the Seattle way. That's one model. Cleveland actually has been good about getting the private sector in the conversation. Uh, but we don't see that consistently. I was in San Diego a, a couple weeks ago, and nobody's really having the conversation. Right? There are a couple of foundations. And if we're going to see uh, an across-the-board solution, it's got to be something uh, where the locals take it up, but then the locals have to know what local self-organization needs to be. And we can't wait for the federal government. Um, we probably can't wait for the states to do it consistently either. This is going to have to be something that happens locally. Okay, so what I'm going to do is um, if we could have people just come up to the mic. Um, just, um, yeah, I mean, just go ahead and line up, and we'll just, we'll just do it that way. Um, just state your name and, and where you're from and, then, uh, and what your question is. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. The way the panel is uh, moving towards including uh, thinking about housing for low income I'm not sure the one on. or is not. Thank you. So, my question is more about. Um, housing subsidies for low-income families. So this conference being about opportunity uh, and stability in housing, you know, I think of the lower end of um, our uh, distribution. And, 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 and I, I'm wondering, um, there are programs already in operation, of course, low-income housing tax credits and the Housing Choice Voucher Program. And so we did a study. Uh, we're from the Cleveland Fed. I was... <laughs> um, you, you cited a paper from there. And we've been looking at how these programs have been playing out in the field. And when we spoke to people, both uh, administering both programs, they both agreed that voucher use is a mo the most efficient way to um, allocate you know, subsidies. Both, it, that was impressive. But since the money is flowing without their, you know, um, they, they don't decide how the, the money flows in. They have to allocate in the best way. So we kind of found that there was um, uh, the thinking that the programs can complement each other in good ways sometimes, but 
um, but there was a need for an increase in housing choice vouchers. Where is that? Why, why hasn't that been addressed? So, uh, so I would, I've had this argument for a long time. Um, I, I, I actually think that we, we shouldn't be thinking of this as mobility or have in place housing. Right. In many places where you have enough units, vouchers can work well. In Los Angeles, if you gave everyone a voucher, a bunch of people would run around with a voucher and no house for you know, 80 days, you know, four months, whatever. So there are places where you're going to have to build and you're going to need those things. Um, I, I think that uh, giving some local choice and control is useful. The thing, though, that I, that, that I, I think is underemphasized when we think about um, uh, housing assistance is the idea that we need to structure it so that people eventually don't need the ex assistance anymore. And we have a bunch of disincentives in how these programs are run such that if someone gets a job, they lose benefits dollar for dollar. Um, that's not an incentive to work and be self-sufficient. And so we wind up, not, uh, it just becomes the sum of the vouchers and we never graduate people out and bring more people in so that we have that. Those are the things that I think need to be done. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's, a rent, um, there's a rent demonstration that HUD is doing right now. Um, and there's, there needs to be much more experimentation on those sorts of things. Moving to work through the, the public housing is another way that this is done. Um, so, but getting the subsidy to be about transition to self-sufficiency is ultimately where we need to get to. Um, again, that comes back to some of the job stuff as well. So, so let me, um, first of all, vouchers are a very cost efficient way to provide affordable housing. They're not necessarily, they don't necessarily, it depends on location, uh, improve uh, either uh, segregation by race or um, by uh, income. They can often concentrate. You have to be very careful about that. But I want to um, come back to, you know, capacity is really important. And uh, we, we tend to sort of assume that stuff in the past didn't work. But I'm going to make the argument that um, by 2005, 2006, um, the federal government, with its local partners, was actually really good at coupling programs like Hope 6 and low-income housing tax credits and, um, and uh, housing choice factors and putting them together in combinations of packages that worked surprisingly well to meet real needs as well as to, to sort of leverage resources. And unfortunately, um, we've forgotten some of those capabilities. If we could rediscover them, I think we, we would build some capacity. Um, and lastly, let me just say there's no place that it's, um, inclusionary zoning is not a panacea. Um, it can't really produce housing for low income renters, but it does help alleviate housing affordability problems everywhere it's been tried. I've never seen any place that's had a downside to inclusionary zoning. Not to, just to, if I could jump in on this a little bit. If you give vouchers to folks to, to rent properties and the supply of housing stays the same, sort of the basic economics says what's going to happen is rents are going to go up. Um, so you need to address uh, the issue of need but you also have to I address the issue of supply in markets so that can actually deliver the product that people need. Hi, I'm Dr. Bonita Cope from Lycoming College in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. We never had a housing boom, we, so we never had a housing bust because <laughs> we just sort of stay the same. But we do, um, as you know, we are the home of Little League Baseball, and now we are the home of Marcella Shell. Well, we like to think we're the home. It actually goes through the state. So we had our own housing crisis, and Dr. Williamson, who I work with, and I um, were hired by PHFA to look at this. Absolutely, the housing market is interconnected. As we had people come into the community, uh, they were looking for houses to purchase. There are no houses to purchase in our area, or none they were willing to purchase. So they rented nice houses. Those people had to move into less nice houses, and people in the really crappy houses ended up on the street. Now what is interesting, what I'd like your opinion on is, we were contacted by Philadelphia housing developers and they said, we want to come out and talk to you. Now, I don't mean to offend anybody in Philadelphia, but we don't think about you guys a lot. <laughs> Probably because you don't think about us a lot. You know? We have our own reality in the rural areas and you have your reality. Well, we were really surprised. Well, I think I'm gonna, you know, we thought, well, wow, we're important. They want to talk to us. They were excited about the possibility because they said, 
In Philadelphia, it takes us five to seven years to get a project breaking the ground for it. And we were welcoming housing. We wanted housing built. And now what happened is nice apartments were built. They're renting for the incredible cost of $1,200. People were just in shock for a two-bedroom apartment. We've never heard of prices like that. It's down a bit now. A nice apartment costs about $900 a month for a really nice apartment. But we're all talking, these are regulators, these are policy people. What about the individual developer that's got a contracting company that says, hey, I'm willing to build? Is it possible still to go out to California and be that kind of person and break ground on a hundred unit? In California? Yeah. No. See, and that's our problem. <laughs> so, so, so... No, no, so just so let, let me let me let me I was a little flip. So, so, so no, so well, no, if you drive in Murrieta and Riverside and San Bernardino, you see hundreds of houses that were built in greenfield, basically greenfield development, um, very little regulatory oversight. And they were viewed as cash cows by their community because they put a bunch of impact fees on them and they were able in principle, to generate a whole host of, of, of uh, revenue that allow communities to do things. So even in the high regulatory, you know, the crazy Californians, um, you can do that. Uh, but the question is, um, do you do that at the peril of the broader marketplace? Um, because you, you, could, you could make, you know, 16 billion purple hats. Right? No one actually has to buy them, and if they don't buy them, then you go bankrupt. Right? And so, so you, there needs to be some respect to the marketplace. What I would say is this for, in your situation. The Marcellus Shale is actually a, a pretty transformative economic engine, very similar to what's happening in North and South Dakota uh, around the same sorts of things. And we're seeing housing pressures in those places as well. This is a basic response to what people are viewing as perhaps a stable, uh, a stable market transformation that requires a different level of housing infrastructure. And part of the challenge that, that, that you guys have to, to wrestle with, I think, is um, you know, are, do you take any old housing at any cost, uh, at any price? Um, are there ways that you want to manage how that development plays out and how it looks, where it goes, what kind of inclusivity there is, you know, all those sorts of questions. Or do you take every, any person who goes out there and says, I want to build 100 of this, and okay, I want to build 300 of that, okay. That's something the community should talk about. Uh, but to me, these are all responses to market forces, and, and you talk to any developer, they'd rather build greenfield than in where other people are because people make demands, right? People are paying in the butt. And so, so that's the easier stuff, but the market often isn't there to support the, the level of development there. It doesn't take seven years to get a house built in Philadelphia. It is hard to get a house built in Philadelphia. The, the regulatory process is not as streamlined, as transparent as it should be, and there's a, there's a labor cost premium of, what, what did you guys? 20. 20, it's probably higher. Um, and 20 to 30. It's, 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 there's a, you know, it's, it's a cost more, and, and you don't get more um, uh, on the price end. So there are some problems, but Philadelphia's biggest problem, and the reason you're seeing all those developers is we have 40,000 vacant parcels, but they're the wrong size, and there are some, many of them are in the wrong location. Uh, they're too small. They're they're not the right shapes. They're fragmented. They have strange uh, uh, entitlement issues associated with them, and so developers can't reach the profitable scale by building in uh, Philadelphia. Some can, but mo many can't, and they can in many other communities. So that's where they're going to go. So just to add on to that real quickly, we are bringing on 2,500 apartment units in Center City, Philadelphia, this year. It's really not as hard to develop here as in many places. I've been working in Lower Marion Township, which is one of their wealthiest townships in the state, and they've been trying to build a building for now 11 years. And the surprise, so, and the surprise there is what? They're yeah. trying to move to California. Yeah. They're all townships are trying to move to California. And it's also true that I spent earlier last week in Texas where you know they have a, uh, a fracking boom, and... There they have very low-cost production of housing. I'm not sure you really like the, the, the results 
completely, but lots of people do. They're growing really rapidly, and the supply response has been very effective there. Um, but I would I would be really surprised if you couldn't find lots of Philadelphia developers to come to your town to That's develop. Right. David Feldman from Right Sized Homes, um, both a practitioner in uh, infill urban development, but also on the policy level, neighborhood policy and land bank policy. And by the way, the Marcella Shell did act, uh, send impact fees that actually became the first funding source for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund in Pennsylvania and the Shell counties. Um, my question is about, I guess, using the older homes, um, basically housing preservation as opposed to the cost of building new homes, because most developers don't want to build a new home that's less than 2,500 square feet. Um, the homes built in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and if you look at the mean size, tend to be sort of 900 to 1,400 square feet uh, by median average census um, square footage in those times. And the cost of rehab is, is much less than new construction, but unfortunately, a lot of the neighborhoods from the 50s and 60s, both city and inner suburbs, uh, are neighborhoods where those homes, because of all the um, deferred maintenance issues and such, the value in the homes themselves aren't enough for the people to have to put the 50, 60, 70, because it costs the same to do a roof, a bathroom, a kitchen, a heating system in that house as it does in a $300,000 house. And so what are the – aside? NSP was one example to work on Philadelphia and Flint that looked at reusing these homes. Is there a way to make that something that's units that exist, but Dick, like you said, sometimes are now crappy because they have 40-year-old everything um, – ways to look at existing older housing stock to bring it up to speed to be able to get more units for the same money. Uh, I'd like to jump into that. From a, one, one aspect of what you said is right now if you look at the scale of units that developers are building in the city of Philadelphia, they're very small. You have one bedrooms are 750 square feet. They used to be 850 to eight to 900. But that's for single. That's line. that's. I'm talking about family size, small family size. Right, right. and two bedrooms are 1,200 square feet, and three bedrooms are 1,600 square feet. It's a it's an urban versus suburban. It's a multi-family versus single-family thing. But with respect to renovation. Um, it's you you raise a, a, real, a lot of really interesting questions. I'll add in another issue to that is a lot of the places where you would want to either uh, renovate or build new are along, for example, in Philadelphia, along the transit lines. Uh, but they're also the oldest communities and they're the most run down and the most troubled and the most distressed. So you have sort of this confluence of places where you really would want to renovate and it'd be good for your layout of your city and economically very attractive, but there are also the places that still have serious problems. Yeah, let me, let me pick up on that. A lot could be done in Philadelphia on transit-oriented development that isn't being done because SEPTA and, uh, and the various municipalities don't seem to be able to get together. But back to your point, you know, Philadelphia housing is not Brooklyn housing. Brooklyn or New York brownstones are much more malleable. Our, our homes were built as sort of working-class homes in the in the uh, right around the turn of the 20th century, they're pretty small, as you've indicated. They're I'm thinking of the 50s and 60s, the the Oxford Circle, mm -hmm. and closer in Delaware County, and well, um, there there could be a lot so done. Right. But as, as as you said, the pr the problem is there, there and also in, in in Northeast Philadelphia, those areas. As you said, the the problem is really that you you don't get a sufficient return. Uh, on that investment. Now, again, um, if, if I'm not going to call too much for the federal government here because I'm wary, but if you could, uh, many of those houses are not that energy efficient, and if you could have a, a, a federal program that uh, financed some of the retrofit and along the way helped improve their uh, functionality and energy, you could probably break that return equation a little bit and, and get a few people to, to retrofit their houses. This would be like the PACE program that. that uh we try to do, but but it's extremely difficult because of the legal, legal issues yeah, is. and yeah. and 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 uh, lien status and the lenders not wanting to 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 give in on that. Um, that'd be great. I mean, I, I'd love to see that work. Um, I'm I'm um, we've been beaten up on that a bit. Um, I, I I do. I want to say two things on this. One. Um, you know, the weatherization actually that that came through the stimulus was extremely. Uh, successful in improving the quality and performance of housing and and so we should be thinking about ways to continue that. I actually think you know something like a um, a city level r r first time or second time home by a rehabilitation tax credit uh, 
where if you took bought a home in a certain district and rehabbed it, you got some sort of tax credit the, the way that some do for first-time home buyers that buy in a city. Um, that might be something that would be uh, of value or useful. Um, and then the second thing is, you know, um, my own plug. Um, so um, this notion of renovation and preservation of affordable housing as something that is at a crisis level and worthy of a lot of attention is a relatively new concept. You know, the contracts for most of these things uh, didn't start expiring until relatively recently. Uh, and so um, the MacArthur Foundation has asked us to do a, a study of what are the best practices in preservation uh, and, and how should we um, expand our knowledge base on what effective preservation is because I think this is a, it, it is an important question and the, 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 the guy who asked the question, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, um, um, the notion of inner ring suburb preservation as being qualitatively different than the urban spaces is, is interesting uh, and so I'm going to write that down so you, that we pay attention to that. Okay. I think you, sir, will be the last question since we're almost out of time. Well, go ahead, please. Yes, um, I'm uh, from Baltimore, and, uh, you know, Baltimore's a very fatalistic city for probably some good reasons. Uh, but right now there's probably, we're looking at 2,500 uh, new market rate apartments being built each year for the next, like, three years. And now people are thinking bubble. So do you think that that's, a possible scenario. I guess that would be like building 7,000 a year in Philadelphia right now. Um, a bubble in Baltimore. People so are kind of scared by that thought because there hasn't been much housing produced in Baltimore for a long, long time. Well, I'm from Baltimore. Right. Go ahead. And that's about all I know about Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but I, I do think I do think that you know it's the net amount of housing being con being sort of on the market and. You know, part of Baltimore is becoming a lot more attractive, and they managed to get market rate units there, and a lot of other stock that's been falling off at a remarkably fast rate in Baltimore. Um, so um, it doesn't strike me as necessarily calling bubble. It's, it seems it's part of the, you know, as Raphael said, you know, part of the cities are growing and part are dying. You know, well, that was you, John. I'm sorry. Yeah, that wouldn't be enough to keep the population from falling. Right, <laughs> but but still, but it might be that the housing stock, even with seven thousand units or two thousand units, is still shrinking. So yeah, yeah. Um, but go ahead. Uh, well, I, I think that's that's a good point, and uh, I but I think the trends that Dick, were talk, Dick was talking about were, are real and they're permanent. Um, young, the, the millennial generation really does want to be back in the city, and they don't care about cars as much, and they really do like. Uh, city-based amenities. I guess the question is whether there are going to be 2,500 of them in, in Baltimore, and I would bet that there are. Um, so that, that's, the, um, that's uh, really the good news. But let me come back to my original sort of chart about New York. Um, in, in 1990 was when the crime rate first went down in New York. Uh, it took 10 years for the housing market to respond to that. The other thing that happened in New York is it, it um, starting around 2000, um, the school system, the aggregate performance of the school system really started to improve. Now some schools did better, some schools did worse. Uh, charters, there's a whole issue on charters. Um, I think if in Baltimore, if you, uh, you know, if a combination of crime and reduced crime and better schools will show up in attracting those millennials. So I, I agree with that. I have a hard time thinking of Baltimore as a bubble place. I mean, just, just, just knowing the dynamic there, um, and you know the, the the recent decades have not been placed a, a period of explosive growth. My guess is that even though real estate developers tend to be your most optimistic people, um, they've all had their shirts handed to them at some point in Baltimore and would be relatively cautious and moving too aggressively forward. Um, but I did want to say one last thing. I know I'm, I'm going over. Um, um, because Dick's comments about the city coming back, I think, are all right. Um, but I, I worry about whether all communities in the cities that come back will be coming back. And I'm less optimistic about that. And I, and I think that you know, we should be um, at least having a conversation about how we can make sure that as things improve in these places, um, all people see and experience some of that improvement. Just if I could just help, I absolutely do not think that all communities and cities are coming back because they don't offer what people 
the, what the, the groups of people that I suggested are looking for. And there are huge problems. For example, Oxford Circle in Philadelphia is a tough sell to a lot of people. So I don't think that I see any evidence that they are coming back. On, but on balance, I think we've shifted from decline to growth. And I think that's a fundamentally different dynamic. But I, I agree completely with what Rafi just said. Great. Well, on that, please join me in thanking our panel.